Thank you very much, Bill, and thank you, Emmett, for the opportunity to uh, speak to you all today. I really appreciate this opportunity to present some exciting research that we hope translates into clinical use and to better diagnose glaucoma and restore lost vision. Glaucoma Research Foundation is a nonprofit nationwide with the mission to cure glaucoma and restore vision through innovative research. In our 41 years, we have raised more than $60 million to fund more than 250 scientists and clinicians to discover the mechanisms of glaucoma and find better diagnostics and a cure. Two of our Catalyst for a Cure scientists will share their discoveries and plans for you, and I encourage you to visit our website, glaucoma.org, to learn more. You'll hear from the scientists funded by Glaucoma Research Foundation, Dr. Vivek Srinivasan from UC Davis, will join us in a moment to describe some work that he is doing, some very innovative approaches to improve the resolution of optical coherence tomography, and then from Derek Wellsby, who will discuss an approach to vision restoration. So with that, I'd like to invite Vivek Srinivasan from UC Davis to join us. Okay, uh, th thank you, Tom. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Vivek Srinivasan from UC Davis, and I'd like to tell a very uh, short story about how basic science uh, through effective research collaboration can lead to novel clinical diagnostics with the potential to help uh, diagnosis of glaucoma. Now, in glaucoma, vision loss is caused by the death of retinal ganglion cells. And right now, we have several ways of measuring that loss. We can measure the nerve fiber layer with uh, an optical coherence tomography, which represents the axons of the nerve fiber layer. Uh, we can represent this, uh, re measure the cell bodies themselves by measuring the ganglion cell layer. And now, uh, with some recent adaptive optics work uh, from Don Miller's group, we can actually now count ganglion cells in the living human retina as they're lost in glaucoma. Now, it's great to be able to measure this loss, but we'd really like to be able to tell early on uh, when cells are degenerating before they die. And this will allow us to treat at an earlier stage with new treatment modalities and perhaps treat more aggressively to prevent vision loss. And uh, very early in the Catalyst for a Cure, uh, the laboratory of Andrew Huberman at um, University of uh, California, San Diego, discovered that early changes in the retinal ganglion cell dendrites precede uh, changes in the cell bodies and axons themselves. And so he went through in a mouse model and very carefully detailed all of the uh, ganglion cell subtypes, where they have their connections, and when they're lost in glaucoma. And he found in particular that the ganglion cells that connect, stratify in the off sublayer of the inner plexiform layer have the very earliest changes. Uh, since this work in Andy's lab, a number of other labs have reproduced these findings. And it's now well accepted that dendritic changes are the earliest uh, potential biomarker of the stress of the ganglion cell. And so how do we apply these uh, research findings to help diagnose human glaucoma? Well, the inner plexiform layer is a layer of synapses or connections between the bipolar ganglion cell and amacrine cells. And it's divided into on and off sublayers, and those layers have further uh, subdivisions. And if you really squint at a near infrared OCT, you can kind of start to see some of the sublayers within the inner plexiform layer. Uh, but it's not very clear on commercial instruments, and we want to use this as a biomarker, so we really need better resolution. Now, in OCT, or optical coherence tomography, we know we can improve the resolution by increasing the bandwidth of the light source. Uh, alternatively, we took the approach of reducing the wavelength. So instead of using infrared light, as is done on the commercial OCTs, we uh, switched to visible uh, light wavelengths with a shorter wavelength, enabling us to get now a micron level resolution and uh, even more uh, in the future sub-micron resolution. We uh, designed and built a visible light OCT system, optimized it over several years uh, with the help of Alfredo Dupra at Stanford University. We employed innovative engineering solutions to account for the unique challenges of uh, imaging the human eye with a visible light OCT, including chromatic aberrations, light exposure, and eye motion. 
We deployed the system in the eye clinic at uh, Stanford University with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Goldberg uh, to image normal and glaucoma patients. And I'll start first with the outer retina because this really shows the fine axial resolution. So we uh, can now see in the outer uh, human retina bands that were not visible before and that are not visible on commercial OCT instruments. In particular, at the very outer edge of the retina, we now see a thin band corresponding to Brooks' membrane. Uh, now, while it might not be re relevant for glaucoma, we think, uh, particularly in aging and in age-related macular degeneration, the ability to, to now quantify and follow Brooks' membrane over time may be particularly valuable. Now, to the inner retina with more averaging, we can now begin to see the sublamination of the inner plexiform layer. Here I show green is the on sublamina, red is the off sublamina, where the ganglion cells stratify. Uh, we can quantify these reflectance changes now. You can see five very clear uh, sublayers with different reflectivities, and they have significant differences. And a commercial OCT, as I mentioned, measures the nerve fiber layer, it measures the uh, ganglion cell layers. Uh, we'd like to add to this arsenal of measurements now an inner plexiform layer thickness as well as the thickness of the sublamination within the inner plexiform layer, which includes both the on uh, shown in green and the off uh, shown in red. And remember that off sublamina is where we saw the very earliest changes in mice. Now, there are many possible changes for this reflectance pattern. We think there's variations in synapse density as well as neurite type. Orientation across the layers uh, are all possible contributors to this reflectance pattern, and they all might change in early glaucoma. And right now, studies in both uh, patients with varying degrees of glaucoma, as well as in uh, patients undergoing novel uh, neuroprotective regenerative therapies are underway. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank uh, my uh, collaborators, funding agencies, and in particular, the Glaucoma Research Foundation, uh, for, for supporting this research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vivek. And as you can see, they've moved now into clinical testing. So uh, there's some real progress and uh, we have some high hopes. Next, I'd like to invite Derek Wellsby to come up and talk about the next catalyst for a cure, which is an ambitious effort at vision restoration. Derek. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be able to come here and talk to you, let's see, uh, about the third iteration of the Catalyst for the Cure on behalf of my uh, team of collaborators. So to review, glaucoma is an axon injury disease. What you're looking at here in this cartoon on the right are retinal ganglion cells. They're the projection neurons that transmit visual information from the eye back to the brain via the optic nerve. And in glaucoma, there's that axon injury at the optic nerve head, leads to axon degeneration, and ultimately cell death. And as the cell dies, you get increasing cupping of the optic nerve, and those parts of the retina become disconnected from the brain, and therefore you get growing visual field defects. And this continues, and in up to one out of six or one out of seven patients will go you know, totally blind in at least one eye despite our best efforts to lower their eye pressure. And that's still current. And so what do we do for these patients? Well, we have two options. It's a cane or a dog. And so there's a lot of interest in trying to regenerate the axons of retinal ganglion cells. But as you can see, that's not gonna work for these patients, right? There are no retinal ganglion cells or axons to regenerate. So you need some more comprehensive strategy that involves replacing or bypassing retinal ganglion cells. Now, of course, to take a stem cell-derived retinal ganglion cell and put it back into the retina, there are several huge challenges. First, you gotta get that cell to survive. Then it's got to integrate into the retina and cross the ILM. It's gotta stratify appropriately and make the appropriate dendritic connections. Then it's gotta regrow its axon back via the optic nerve, decusate appropriately, and find the right visual centers. So the idea behind the third CFC was to bring together a team of four researchers who could address each one of these goals. And that team includes Anna Latore, Jin Duan, Young Hu, and myself. Anna is at UC Davis. She is an expert in retinal ganglion cell development, stem cell biology, 
and is doing some of the, uh, the best work right now on taking retinal organoids and forcing them to adopt a more normal physiology and development. Second is Jin Duan. He's at UC San Francisco, and he's an expert in retinal ganglion cell subtypes and physiology, retinal ganglion cell connectivity, and did some of the pioneering work on identifying those key signaling molecules that cause retinal ganglion cell axons to regenerate, which is one part of the problem we need to tackle. Young Hu is at Stanford. He's an expert in CRISPR gene editing, retinal ganglion cell regeneration, and has done some of the seminal work on identifying those pathways that are involved in ganglion cell death, including in models of glaucoma. And then finally, there's my lab. And what we've been interested in doing is using functional genomic screening to identify those new novel drug targets that might be good neuroprotective strategies for the future of glaucoma. We have two models. We can either use primary mouse retinal ganglion cells or patient iPSC-derived retinal ganglion cells. In both cases, we're able to injure the cell at the axon, modeling glaucoma, and seed them into multi-well dishes. We then wait, and we use either chemical genetics, RNA interference, or CRISPR knockouts to probe the entire genome one by one, looking for those genes that are causally involved in axon degeneration or cell death. We look for those wells where the inhibition promotes survival or decreases degeneration. And we've been actually very impressed by how well this process has worked to find things that, you know, this is an in vitro plastic platform, yet it translates in vivo. So we've screened through about 18,000 genes, again, one by one, and we found that the top gene of that list was a, a kinase called dual leucine zipper kinase, or DLK. And when we inhibit DLK in a mouse model of optic neuropathy, we see robust protection. And we think this is why DLK might be distinguished from other neuroprotective, I mean, there's lots of neuroprotective drug targets out there, but with DLK inhibition, you get robust protection. It is long-lasting throughout the life of the mouse, and the cell that you keep alive has a relatively normal gene expression pattern. And we think it's because we got to it in a relatively unbiased and comprehensive way that it may have these advantages. The idea then for the catalyst for the cure is to bring that same unbiased comprehensive screening strategy to the question of RGC transplantation to optimize those challenges. Of course, I'd like to thank on behalf of Anna, Jin, uh, Young, and myself, uh, Tom Broner, and David Hawkins, and the rest of the SAB at Glaucoma Research Foundation. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you again, and I hope that these have uh, provided some insight on some opportunities that are probably a few years out, but we hope we can count on you.